Formula One tyres have changed a lot, from the skinny radials in the first Grand Prix cars to slicks and then grooved and then back to slicks again. Where today, the tyres continually, or almost continually, support the car at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour and pull up to 6G when on the brakes. So for this episode of Track Evolution, I'm gonna take you from the 50s to today and explain what's changed and why tyres have continually caused arguments in F1. Let's go. Right, so in the 50s, they did tires the old school way. Skinny, treaded tires with relatively simple construction. And really, they weren't much different from the tires you would see on a modern mountain bike. And they were supplied by a whole bunch of different manufacturers. People like Pirelli, Firestone, Dunlop, and Engelbert. But if you take a look at the stats, Pirelli were a class above the rest, taking way more wins and podiums. And this was apparently due to them being both faster and lasting longer, and that seems strange to hear as a current F1 fan, but we'll, we'll get to that bit. The fronts and the rears were the same size, both in diameter and width, so the cars really didn't have a whole lot of grip. Taking a corner in the 50s was kind of a case of cranking on a whole load of steering lock and then just waiting for the understeer to end. Typically, they would then get on the power and turn this into oversteer, and honestly, they were drifting for a lot of the lap. And it gets a bit scary when you think about the braking. These cars were fast. They did about 160 miles an hour on the straights, and they were using very simple, grabby brakes to slow down the car, and the contact patch was like this big. The construction was initially made of cotton fabric with rubber then laid over it. However, Dunlop came in with the R5 racing tire in 1958, which replaced the cotton with nylon. This greatly improved the strength of the tire and reduced the weight by five and a half kilos per tire. But to be honest, this didn't do a whole lot to reduce the unsprung weight as the cars were using steel rims with spokes. These wheels weren't particularly stiff, especially in the corners, and they actually used wheel nuts that were torqued up by hitting them with a mallet. In the early 60s, they introduced synthetic rubber rather than the natural stuff that comes from trees, as well as greatly increasing the width of the tire. And this made sense. Increasing the contact patch is the best way to improve overall grip. And you can do this two ways, either by increasing the width or the diameter. So by this point, Dunlop was the sole supplier for a few seasons, up until 64 when Goodyear stepped up as a second supplier. The rear tires were now often larger than the fronts, but were still using a tread pattern. And it's not like the tread we have on road cars now, where the sole purpose is to pump out water. This tread wasn't as good as that, as the channels were made as small as possible for maximum contact area on the road. The tire manufacturers were also facing another problem at the time. With increased power and increased cornering speeds, the tires were generating a lot of heat and then overheating in the race. And obviously this is really bad for performance as the rubber heats up so much that it begins to break down, wearing very quickly and producing very little grip. And the answer to this was to create harder tires that didn't produce as much heat. But this came with a side effect of taking longer to warm up to peak operating temperatures. Pretty similar to the hard tires we see in F1 now. And it wasn't until 1971 that Firestone introduced the first slick tires. They noticed that you could maximize the contact patch of the tire by just removing the tread pattern altogether. So instead of adding about 10 millimeters of tread to the tire, they added tread in one smooth surface all around the tire. The performance gain was huge, with the lap times changing significantly as a result. If you remember this graph from a previous episode, you can see that the theoretical lap time difference between 1970 and 1971 was pretty significantly different. Impressive stuff. The 70s was also the era where aerodynamics really took hold, and with that came greatly increased loads on the tires. Well, they suddenly had to deal with around double the load compared to just five years ago. This also meant that the tires generated much more heat with more power in the cars, aero working its magic and cornering speeds rising quickly. So manufacturers began working on different compounds of tires with different additives to reduce the wear at high temperatures. But they also created a tire that was softer, starting the age of the qualifying tire where the tires were designed to last one flying lap with absolute maximum performance and then they'd fall off a cliff. The tires also began to equal out between the front and the rear, both using similar width and similar diameter rubber. And then in 1985, tire blankets were first used. And this was a way to get around having the warm up phase where drivers would have to work the tires hard on an outlap to bring them up to temperature. But to explain that, let me pass you over to Scott. My name's Scott Mansell. I'm auditioning for role as presenter. Most people might think you do this by jumping on the brakes, doing burnouts or cranking on loads of understeer like Alonso does. But this can cause issues if not done right. 
If you just did burnouts, you warm the surface much more than the sidewall and the core of the tire, which can create blistering or massively increased wear. So you need to bring the whole tire up slowly. This is normally by weaving, loading the tire gently in the corner and working the tire progressively. And back when I was racing in X Formula One cars in Boss GP, you had to do this without taking too much life out of the tyre, as those tyres barely lasted a full lap at quality pace. Scotty out. Anyway, the tyre blankets solved that issue. You could programme them to bring up the rubber to temperature slowly and come out of the pits at full chat. To begin with, they use essentially tents with heaters in, bringing the temperature of the tyres up slowly, but not very much and often all of that temperature was gone by the time you'd carried them to the grid. So then they started essentially modifying electric blankets and those are like the ones your parents have on their bed. And it allowed much greater control of the temperature as well as being better insulated so that they stayed warm all the way to the grid. And since then they've got far more complex with better heating elements and temperature sensors allowing the teams to be very, very precise with how they heat them up. Remember, around this time, the turbo and ground effect era was sending speeds sky high, loading tires to their absolute maximum. The structure and general strength of the tire grew a lot in this time, not necessarily with materials, but with the general design of the carcass. Now, over the early to mid 90s, speeds got very, very high, with driver aids coming in, massive advancements in suspension systems, and very light cars. But really, the tires stayed pretty similar. That is up until 97. The FAA decided to further reduce speeds they would limit grip, but not in the conventional way they had up until now by reducing downforce. Instead, they brought in groove tires, which on the surface is a bit confusing. They reduced the contact patch of the tire, but not by just reducing the width of the tire itself, but by adding grooves. Setting aside that using much narrower tires would look weird, the narrower tyres brought another issue into play. They would greatly reduce drag. Now, if you think about it, the surface of the tyre is travelling in the opposite direction to the airflow at the front of the car. So if you're doing 100 miles an hour, the speed difference between the, the air and the surface is 200 miles an hour, bringing with it massive drag. On a modern car, the drag from the tyres is equivalent to one hatchback at motorway speeds, and that's per tyre. So what the reduced grip would reduce in cornering speeds, the narrower tyres could just add back. So anyway, they went with the groove tires. But this had another effect. The grooves were really tough to construct for the manufacturers. If the tire compound was too soft, they would wear really quickly and break away from the tire. So it actually placed a limit on how soft the tires could be, again, slowing the cars. But really it meant the tires could go for longer, meaning the drivers could really push on them from lights out to the checkered flag. And remember that? That was pretty cool. At this point though, there was an all out tire war. Bridgestone and Michelin were battling it out to try and solve the groove tire problem. And the biggest issue was graining. But what you did was rip the edge of the, the block, effectively the continuous block. Yeah. And as that ripped, then you would be rolling over the tire. So there's a lot of marbles from that type of tire. And we were at that time allowed to run scrub fronts on new rears. So we did that quite often in qualifying because you just couldn't get the, you couldn't get the front tire not to green on, on your timed lap. It was just, for me, it was a lost era of Formula One because it was dominated by tires. So essentially the tires weren't great until you'd worn them in and then gone through that graining process. On introduction, lots of drivers complained. Jack Villeneuve, most of all really, saying that the cars were now harder to stop and more prone to spinning. And the FIA gave him a slap on the wrist for that one. And as we know, the biggest tyre related drama around this time was the 2005 Indianapolis Grand Prix, which is a video in itself. But essentially, the tyres weren't up to the loads that they were subject to on the banking. But weirdly, this only affected the Michelins. So the six Bridgestone runners then took part in the world's most boring race. It wasn't a good look for F1. Now, over the next years, there were a few more changes. The front tyres went from three grooves to four and Bridgestone eventually became the sole supplier in 2007. They provided four different compounds with two on offer for each race. Then to denote the different compound, the softer tire, they called it the option tire, was shown with a white line in one of the grooves. That's rather than the different colors we have on the sidewalls now. This lasted up until 2009, where Bridgestone announced they were stepping down from the sport. Michelin, Cooper Avon, and Pirelli all showed interest in securing the sole tire supplier role. And as we know, Pirelli secured it. Pirelli removed the grooves and Formula One was back to slicks again, but that didn't mean they would suddenly last the entire race. I mean, Hamilton was leading the 2010 Spanish Grand Prix before his front tire just left the chat and spat him in the barrier. Pirelli were asked by the FIA to deliberately 
create tyres that would degrade rapidly. And that was due to what happened back in 2010 in Canada. For that race, the Bridgestone tyres were degrading unusually fast due to higher track temperatures. So many of the cars had to use three or four stops to make it work. And that really did shake up the race. But the FIA liked that and Pirelli then seemed to take it a bit far. The tyres were really unpredictable and degraded unbelievably fast. And there was a lot of backlash from the drivers saying they had to tiptoe for the whole race. And the team saying that the strategy was almost a lottery. I mean, 2017, seemingly out of nowhere, half the grid had a tyre let go. Vettel accidentally lost the lead of the championship because of it. Then in 2018, Bottas's tyre just let go because of a tiny bit of debris in Baku. And there's been a whole lot more. And really since then, Pirelli have been slowly developing the tyres each year keeping the shorter life but making them more and more predictable and really in the past two years with speeds and aerodynamics increasing dramatically the loads through the tires have also been growing and it's shown because they've still had a load of seemingly random blowouts even as recently as max in baku this year and then silverson last year we all know what happened there and then that brings us up to next year where pirelli are moving to 18 inch tires rather than the 13s we've had for many years and this is going to be interesting because they shouldn't have the same structural issues that these current tyres have had, but here's hoping anyway. But this will limit the grip as the current 13-inch tyres play a large role in the suspension of the car. This essentially comes as the tyres perform best with as little pressure as possible. So with all this squish in the sidewall, there was no point in having loads of travel in the suspension because you could just use the tyre. Whereas the 18s will have a stiffer, slightly smaller sidewall and they will also have slightly less overall grip. But it looks like it will produce better racing and relate the tyres better to the ones that Pirelli sell for your road car. And I guess that's what they want. Anyway, check out this video to see how tyres have played a role in the overall performance of the cars and how lap times have dropped because of it. Check out this video here. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.